So to Mara, first of all, Mara, a little short story. 40 years ago, I had a vision, a vision that would see an urban population living in a community with wildlife. But you know what? This wasn't as easy to do as I originally thought. And then along came people like Mara, Mara McCaffrey. Mara is now leading in her field, doing a lot of interesting things. She's a registered ISA certified arborist and a master's student at McMaster. Her studies cover urban native plant communities and rehabilitation of those horrible looking roadsides. Her love of native plants and solitary bees fosters connections between people and habitats. Inventories with Hamilton Naturalist Club, Royal Botanical Gardens and her work with Oakville Green Conservation Association has augmented her research capabilities. But today, the development of her useful toolkit is highlighted. And I think that will go well in supporting the creation of urban gardens that protect wildlife. So, Mara, I'm going to turn it over to you. You enjoy yourself and thank you for coming. Thanks, Joanne. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. So um, first of all, thanks so much, Daniel, for, for such a great talk. And I think it really um, sets a, a little bit of context for what I'm going to be talking about, which is sort of one way that you can start to foster that relationship with um, the, the land on which we live and, and with this really special ecoregion, the Carolinian uh, zone. So I'm going to be talking about um, how you can create your own Carolinian garden, a, a plant Carolinian species on, on your own property. Uh, so to start with, um, I have this photo of one example of a Carolinian garden. Uh, this is from the church garden, um, and they've done such a great job there on their property. So a Carolinian garden is just a garden like any other, except that it contains plants that grow naturally uh, in the Carolinian zone. And the, the Carolinian zone or ecoregion uh, basically covers southern Ontario up to just about north of Toronto, so it includes Hamilton. And it's basically a specific community of plants um, that grow in this region, and we also find them further south in the United States, um, right down to sort of North Carolina, South Carolina, and so that's where the name comes from. Um, and so really it's just about growing plants that are found naturally in their area, and so they support all of the insects and birds and wildlife uh, that you would find in natural spaces in our area. So um, I'm going to be calling it a Carolinian Garden today. Um, you'll also hear people call it different terms, so I just wanted to put out um, some other terms that are used to describe these kinds of gardens in case you see them uh, if you're sort of researching the topic. So people will also just call it a native plant garden because the plants are native to the area. They've been here for thousands of years. Um, some people will call their garden a pollinator garden because these Carolinian plants support all of the pollinators that have um, adapted to, to use the plants for pollen or for food or, or that kind of thing. And then people will also call it a wildlife garden because when we plant the plants that are also found in nature, we're supporting all sorts of wildlife and we're building those relationships with the wildlife around us. So a Carolinian garden, it's really just about gardening with nature in mind, gardening in a way that supports wildlife and supports nature. Um, and in terms of why you might want to plant a Carolinian garden, I think Daniel gave us, you know, that great idea that really it's, it's about fostering relationships um, with nature and uh, different parts of our natural world. And in a sort of more sciencey way of saying that is supporting biodiversity. So supporting the variety of life that we have around us uh, and that life does so many wonderful things for us and it nurtures us in so many different ways. Um, you're, because the plants are really well adapted to this area, you end up not needing to do as much maintenance on your garden, which is great from sort of a more practical uh, point of view. Um, and then again, fostering those relationships has so many benefits in terms of uh, feeding insects that go on to pollinate crops. Um, our natural systems prevent flooding by intercepting rainwater. You're fighting climate change by planting more plants that are absorbing carbon dioxide, that are filtering pollution from the air. 
that are making us feel better because there's now uh, studies showing us that we feel better when we're in more natural spaces. And it just helps us to learn more about um, the natural systems around us. So if you're interested in planting a Carolinian garden, the rest of it is gonna be based on how you might go about turning part of your property into a Carolinian garden, or even just planting some Carolinian plants uh, in a pot if you're not ready for the whole garden. And so as Joanne mentioned, I was part of a volunteer group that put together this toolkit that you can access online. Um, and it sort of gives you all sorts of information and resources about um, Carolinian plants and how you can go about creating a Carolinian garden. And so I'm just going to take a moment to um, share with you what the toolkit looks like. Um, so I'm just going to navigate to the website just for a moment. So hopefully you can see um, it says Plant Paradise Toolkit. So this is the Hamilton Pollinator Paradise website. It's an initiative to try to get people to plant gardens that support pollinators across Hamilton. Uh, and it's a project of the Hamilton Naturalist Club and Environment Hamilton, which are two wonderful groups in Hamilton. Um, and so you can scroll through this toolkit and see all sorts of great information. Or if you're interested in a specific topic, you can click these uh, buttons at the top and they'll bring you right to a topic. So I'm going to move back to my slides now and my slides are basically just going to be uh, highlights from this toolkit. Uh, but just know that you can go to this website and get more detailed information later because I only have 20 minutes to kind of go through the highlights. There we go. Okay. Um, so I'm basically going to be talking to you about the steps for creating a Carolinian garden all the way from choosing a site and designing your garden to planting and maintaining it. So we will start with step one, which is choosing and sort of getting to know your site. Um, so when you're deciding on a garden site, you don't want to just go to the nursery and pick out plants without kind of knowing uh, where you're planting them and, and what that site is like. So some things to consider if you're putting in a new garden or are where's your nearest water source. So uh, you don't want to put something in so far away from your hose that you can't ever water the site because it does need water until it can establish. You'll want to think about how much sun you get in a day. Some plants, like plants you find in a meadow, they love sun all day long. Other plants are used to growing in the forest and so they like shadier spots. You'll want to think about the existing vegetation. So do you have lawn there right now? Is it a, a garden full of other plants? Is it kind of weedy? Um, so just to start thinking about that. Um, one thing that people sometimes forget about is property lines and bylaws. So just make sure that you're planting uh, on your own property. And um, in terms of bylaws, what we're talking about is that there are sometimes bylaws about how tall your vegetation can get in your front yard, for example, um, or you know, letting your grass grow a little bit long. So just something to consider uh, as well. You'll also want to look at how wet the area is. If it's an area that floods really often, that's okay. We have plants uh, growing in the Carolinian zone that like wet conditions, but we just need to choose the appropriate plants. Um, you'll want to think about how big the planting area is. You don't want to go off to the store and buy a whole bunch of plants and then realize that you can't fit them in your garden. And then um, you want to sort of consider soil type. You don't need to get too technical with this, but if you know that your soil is really sandy, you want to pick plants that are kind of suited to that. If it's really sticky clay, again, some plants like that, some plants don't. So those are just things to consider when you're picking where you're going to um, plant your garden. So moving to step two, which is design your garden. Um, I'll acknowledge that you know some people really like to plan ahead, some people just like to go with the flow and either way is okay. Um, but you do wanna kind of think about what sorts of things you wanna include in your garden. So if you want to create a beautiful design like we have in the bottom left here, that's great. If you just wanna sort of think about, well, I'd like to include maybe a tree, I'd like to have a couple shrubs, uh, I'd like a path through here, that kind of thing. Those are things to think about ahead of time so you know again how much space you have in general. Um, some just general tips. Uh, it's always great to start small. You can always expand later on, um, but you don't want to take on this huge ambitious pro uh, project and it be overwhelming. Um, if you're trying to attract and support pollinators, you'll want to think about planting in patches. So rather than having a certain type of plant sort of scattered throughout the garden, if you clump a few together, it's easier for the pollinators. That way they can go to one spot and get a lot of what they need rather than having to travel around your whole garden to uh, get to the specific plant that they like. 
you want to think about how you use the space. So if you have a dog that needs space to run around, you want to kind of uh, allow for that. If you want to have a path to be able to walk through, you want to think about that, or maybe a bench or uh, a nice log for you to sit on. Those are all uh, design considerations. And then one thing you'll definitely want to include your garden are the non-living or non-plant elements to your garden. So it's not just about the plants. Consider using some rocks and logs to provide habitat for insects and wildlife. Uh, maybe you want to have a shallow bowl of water to provide a water source for the insects and birds that are visiting your garden. And finally, I'd encourage you to include a little bit of bare soil in your garden somewhere that's not covered by leaves or mulch because a lot of our native uh, bees that do such a great job pollinating our, our plants, uh, they actually nest in the ground and so they need access to the ground. Okay, so those are just some basic design tips. Again, the toolkit has this in a lot more detail, so I encourage you to check it out. So once you've designed your garden in general, you'll want to choose which plant species uh, you're going to put in there. Um, and the main thing about a Carolinian garden is that we're trying to use species that grow in the Carolinian zone. They're, they're native to this zone. They've been growing here for thousands of years. Those tend to support the most biodiversity. Um, they support our systems because all the other wildlife is used to those plants. They formed relationships with those plants. Um, that said, maybe you have certain types of plants that you really like. They're from another part of the world, so they're, they're considered exotic. They've been introduced here um, usually by settlers. Um, and so it's okay to include some of those if you really like them. Um, and, and some of them the bees do tend to like. So um, I think the church garden is a great example of a garden where um, they can introduce all these great native plants, but um, they still kept some of the exotic plants that have special meaning uh, in those gardens. The one thing I would discourage you from including in your garden are invasive plants. So these are exotic plants uh, that tend to be really aggressive. They spread into our natural areas and they kind of take over an area. And so it means that our, our local plants can't grow there once, once these plants have taken over. Um, and, and Daniel mentioned a few of them. Um, English ivy is one that I see in a lot of gardens. Periwinkle is another one that I see. And while they can be beautiful plants, we have a lot of beautiful plants that are uh, native to this area that are could could do just as well in terms of beauty um, but they won't have that detrimental effect and they will support so much more life. Other things to think about when you're choosing plants are of course choosing plants that are suited to the sun and moisture condition that you assessed ahead of time so it's a lot easier to pick plants that are suited to your site than it is to try to modify your site um, to suit certain plants. So if you have a shady site just ask the nursery what plants are going to grow in a shady area and you can find a lot of that information online as well. Another thing you'll want to think about in terms of providing habitat is including different growth forms. Um, so not just wildflowers, but maybe some trees and shrubs, um, maybe some grasses because those are great for providing habitat for insects and birds. Um, a lot of our grasses actually support a lot of moth and butterfly species, even though you might not think of it. Um, so I thought this picture on the right was a great example. Again, this is from the church where we've got wildflowers, but we've also got some grasses and they have some shrubs in the background as well. If you want to support pollinators, one thing that you can do is make sure that you're including plants that flower at different times of the year so that the pollinators always have something that they can be collecting pollen from. So maybe you include some wild strawberry that flowers early in the spring, some asters and goldenrod that flower later in the, in the year in September, and then maybe some milkweeds that kind of flower in the middle. And finally, if you like to attract birds to your yard, one thing that you can do is plant things that have uh, attracted seeds or fruits that the birds can eat. So our shrubs are really good for that. Something like a service berry shrub uh, provides great fruit that the birds love to eat. Okay, so we're moving on to step four. Um, depending on what your design is, there's a lot of different types of prep work that you might want to do. If you're um, putting in, say, a rain garden, you can see that they've dug a hole here to do that. Um, what I'm going to go over quickly is just if you have, say, a lawn or a weedy area and that's what you're trying to turn into your garden, there's different ways that you can kind of get rid of that vegetation so that you have uh, more of a blank slate for your Carolinian garden. So if you have already sort of a garden area and it's just a few weeds here and there, hand weeding is a really great option. If you have an area of lawn or you know that the weeds are really aggressive, then you might want to try one of these other methods. And I have the lasagna method, which I'll talk about 
solarization and just stripping sod if you just have sod. So I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures of a com combination of the lasagna method and solarization. Um, so this is a project that I worked on in Oakville and the first three pictures are what we call the lasagna method. And this is where you basically create layers like a lasagna of cardboard or newspaper and either mulch or topsoil or leaf compost and you layer them above the existing vegetation. And so it basically kind of smothers the existing vegetation and it creates a bed that you can plant in. So you can see on the top, we've got some cardboard. We use cardboard because we were dealing with some really aggressive uh, plants. And then we layered on top of that, we put some newspapers and then on top of that, we had mulch. And so you can see uh, the bottom left is what it looked like when we were done with that. And then we actually solarized the area as well. And so solarizing is when you put clear black plastic over the area and you kind of hold it down with some weights and then you actually leave that for up to even a month or two and it basically just bakes uh, the area underneath uh, to kind of kill those weeds. And so after we uh, were done with the solarizing, I think we added some, some sort of compost on top and then you plant right into uh, your lasagna. And uh, again, the toolkit goes into these different methods in more detail if you are curious about that. Okay, so next we have actually planting your garden. So um, just a note about planting, you can choose to go with like purchase seeds or you can choose to purchase plugs that have already been uh, germinated and they have sort of strengths and weaknesses. So um, seeds are a lot cheaper, you get a lot more for um, the same price, but you do have to actually get them to germinate and to grow. And so this picture on the top, uh, this is inside my house, I'm germinating a number of different seeds um, and then I'll put those into the garden once they are bigger. Um, Plugs are more expensive, but they're already sort of established. You can get them flowering in the first year even, and they kind of make the garden look, um, they sort of create an immediate effect in the garden. It looks like it's doing something. Um, so you can choose what you like best, or you can choose a combination. Maybe you're gonna put in a few plugs to um, kind of get that immediate effect, but then you fill in the area with some seeds. Uh, and if you're interested in growing seeds, the toolkit has some information about how to germinate. Um, native seeds. So this little graphic is from the toolkit again and I just put it on there. It kind of goes through the proper way to plant a plug, um, but I'll just kind of go through a few tips. Um, one being is that our Carolinian species, um, it's best to plant them in the fall or the early spring, so not when it's hot outside. Uh, if you think about in nature, this is when the seeds would be dropping off the plants, either later in the fall or maybe they held onto a plant throughout the winter and they drop onto the soil early in the spring. So as long as the soil's not frozen, you can plant even in November, you can plant in March, um, because they actually need that cold weather to break the dormancy of the seed. Um, and they don't like, if, if they're not established yet, it's not good to plant them uh, in the summertime. Uh, make sure that you plan first. So remember that your plants will get bigger generally, even if you're buying plugs, they're gonna expand out. So you can ask the nursery to look up what the final size of the plant is gonna be and leave some space because it will fill in. And then finally, there's not a lot of maintenance to do, but in the first year or two, I, we do recommend watering the plants in the summertime because the root systems aren't really established yet. And so they're not as good at getting their own water. And finally, step six is maintaining the garden. Um, and as I mentioned before, these are plants that are adapted to our conditions, so there's not a ton of maintenance that needs to be done. Um, but one thing that you'll see uh, in multiple seasons here on this little graphic from the toolkit is leaving things alone. So um, we really encourage people to leave their leaves and twigs uh, either in a pile or just throughout their garden over the winter time because a lot of our insects need somewhere to go over the winter to stay safe and warm until they emerge in the spring. And so they'll nestle under those leaves and twigs and uh, emerge in the spring. And if you do have sort of standing stems from last year, if you're gonna cut them off, just leave maybe a foot or so of the stem standing because we have a lot of bees that will actually nest right in those holes in the stems. So if you're trying to support insects, that's something to keep in mind. 
Okay, so um, in terms of where to find plants, not all nurseries carry Car Carolinian plants, although um, more and more are starting to carry them because more people are asking for them. Um, and before I kind of go through this list, I just want to show you this is sort of a before and after shot of one of the gardens at the church, uh, just so you can see what a transformation it is. And you can see how they left space between their plants because it obviously fills in quite a bit. Um, so in terms of where to find plants, on native plants is a website you can order right off the website and I believe they'll deliver them to you if you'd like. This year for the first time some Loblaw Garden Centers are carrying Ontario grown native plants which is really great it's an initiative uh, that Carolinian Canada was working on. Just look for the in the zone tag uh, on the plant so that you know it's been grown here and that it's native to the area. And then the rest of this list um, is sort of more specialized native plant nurseries and I thought um, this is something you can refer back to uh, when this webinar is posted if you want a list. And these are also listed on the toolkit. Okay, um, so hopefully you're sort of seeing this and seeing how beautiful these gardens are and thinking, I want to do this myself. But I wanted to acknowledge that not everyone has maybe the time or space or resources to put in a whole new garden on their property for whatever reason. Or maybe you have a balcony like me and so you don't have the space to do all that. And so um, this, oh, sorry, this is from the toolkit. Um, and this is basically some quick things that you can do no matter what your garden looks like, no matter what plants are in there, or, or even on your balcony, um, to support biodiversity, to uh, foster those relationships with insects, that kind of thing. So first one is please don't use pesticides in your gardens. Um, they target a lot of uh, important species, bees that are pollinating our crops, or if birds are eating insects that have eaten pesticides, it can have a really detrimental effect. So please don't use pesticides on, in your garden. Um, if you're not ready to plant native plants, um, that's fine, but please don't plant invasive plants. So please check ahead of time what you're planting and make sure that it's not considered invasive in Ontario um, because those really have a negative impact on our, on our natural systems. If maybe you have a, a balcony like me, um, you can try just planting some Carolinian species in a pot. Maybe you don't want to put out a whole garden, but a lot of these are fine for just a pot. So that's something you can do to kind of just get started. If you have an existing garden, um, you can consider just swapping some of your non-native plants with your native plants. So maybe you go and buy annuals every year uh, at the garden center, and maybe this year instead you go out and try out a couple uh, native plant species. If you're a veggie gardener, that's great. Maybe just try letting some of your plants grow to flower so that um, you're providing a bit of pollen for the bees. And again, as I already talked about, just leaving your leaves, even if you don't have a Carolinian garden, if you have another kind of garden, just leave those leaves and twigs to provide some habitat for insects. Um, this slide is just sort of about um, ways that you can enjoy your garden or sort of get involved in the gardening community. Um, so, the great thing about uh, Carolinian gardens is they attract all sorts of bees and birds and so you can try identifying them. Um, you can certify your garden through the Hamilton Pollinator Paradise Project and they'll send you this great we're feeding pollinators sign which is kind of cool for talking to the neighbors about it. Um, there's a website called In the Zone Gardens and you can add your garden to their tracker. They're kind of tracking who's, who's planting these kinds of gardens and they also provide you with a lot of great resources. They have these great garden guides which is great. And of course, just make sure that you're getting out there and enjoying your garden. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge, let me just make sure I have time, yep. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, everything I've told you today is things that I've learned from other people and other resources, and there's a lot of great resources out there. So if this is something you're interested in or you wanna learn more before you decide if this is something you wanna do, um, I've got the Hamilton Pollinator Paradise website up here, which is where you can find the toolkit. I've got the websites for Hamilton Naturalist Club and Environment Hamilton. They're great organizations. They do all sorts of uh, informative things. They've all got all sorts of projects going on. In the Zone Gardens is that website where you can find garden guides and add your garden to their tracker. And that's a project of Carolinian Canada. So there's their website. If you want a more detailed version of kind of what I just told you, WWF Canada um, has a gardening for wildlife webinar series going on. I think they just completed it and those are on YouTube and those are much more detailed versions of sort of what I've been talking about. Um, we've got the church's Carolinian Wildlife Gardening site where this um, conference will be posted. 
check out your local conservation authority. And finally, if you are on Facebook, there is an Ontario Native Plant Gardening group where you can get all sorts of advice and connect with other people. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, so if any of you have questions, I'm happy to uh, take them now. Mara, thank you very much. That was a lot of information, but great information. Um, just before I get into a question, uh, Juan is going to come back at the end of our um, conference and talk about resources and uh, where to find things. And uh, my understanding is that your, your toolkits are going to be posted on our website. So if people want to find a, a spot, a handy spot where they can find all of your toolkits and the information that's in there, they can go to our website. But I'll let Ron um, deal with resources a little, a little later on. Uh, a question has come in from Rose. Are lily of the valley and peppermint okay in a Carolinian garden? Hmm. Yeah, um, lily of the valley is actually considered invasive uh, in Ontario. Um, it will spread into our natural areas, so that's one that we do try to avoid. There is a, a one that, or a plant that looks kind of similar to it um, called uh, Canada Mayflower. Um, so if you're interested in something that looks like lily of the valley, um, I would check that out but uh, it is one that we discourage because I have seen it kind of invading into the natural areas and really taking over. Canada um, Peppermint, well. yeah, yeah. Peppermint, I haven't heard too many bad things about. Um, always good to check, but uh, that one I'm not 100% sure on. Okay, all right. Uh, you mentioned a number of, or a couple of invasives early in your talk. You talked about, um, English ivy and periwinkle that are mm -hmm. often in, found in gardens. They have ground covers. People like them. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any others off the top of your head that are pretty common, commonly bought, commonly planted, that we really should try to avoid and look for all Carolinian alternatives? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not just ground covers, so there are certainly trees, um, the most common one being Norway maple. Mm -hmm. um, those are those maple trees, they often have the reddish colored flowers, or not flowers, reddish colored leaves all year long. Mm -hmm. um, so those are actually quite invasive in uh, our forests. Um, so we try to encourage, if you like maples, just planting a sugar maple or a red maple, something like that. Um, honeysuckle shrubs, uh, we do have Carolinian honeysuckles, but a, um, a lot of the honeysuckles that are grown in gardens are from uh, Asia, and they are very, very invasive in our forests. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there's actually, I should, I should mention, there's a guide that you can get online. It's called Grow Me Instead, and it lists a lot of common invasive garden plants, and then it actually provides alternatives that are Carolinian species that are kind of similar in the way they look or the way that they act. So that's a great one if you're saying, well, I really like the way periwinkle covers the ground. I really like it as a ground cover. They'll suggest alternatives like wild ginger that kind of do the same thing. Um, so that's a great uh, resource to check out. And just to repeat that title, it's called Grow Me Instead? Yeah, Grow Me Instead. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Joanne. We're just a tad ahead of our schedule, and that's absolutely okay, because that gives us a little more time without being so rushed. Joanne, are you there? Am I there? I am there. Okay. Thank you, Mara. I have a surprise for you. Oh. This is, this is why you do not rake leaves and you leave them on the ground. This is a Luna Moth cocoon. That's I so do exciting. not rake up my leaves, and I have insect houses all over my property, and it is so rewarding to find this. So I brought this in and I'll put it right back out after we're done today. Okay. I want it to hatch. I love the beautiful green of the Luna moth. Okay. It's a beautiful, beautiful moth. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So I want to thank you, Mara, Mara, for your knowledge of our Carolinian zone. You've presented so many numerous plans to enable us in doing what must be done. You're going to hear that over and over again. You know that, right? So we want to create wildlife habitats. 